So hello everyone. Thank you for being here and connected through Zoom. So um, we are hosting today uh, Dr. Olga Ioana Tenizu. Uh, I'm going to describe a few things about her from her CV, but I'm not going to describe the the presentation because that will uh, save us some time. So Olga holds a degree in civil engineering and a master of science in soil mechanics from the Imperial College in, in UK. A PhD in engineering seismology from the Aristotle University of uh, Thessaloniki in Greece. She has been a postdoc at the French Institute for Radiological Protection and Nuclear Safety and the Institute of Earth Science at the Université Joseph Fourier. A visiting researcher at UC Berkeley at the Peel, a senior research, uh, researcher at the German Research Center for Geoscience, GFZ, and a senior lecturer at the University of Greenwich before she moved to, back to um, Greece and now she's an associate researcher at the National Observatory of Athens, working on strong motion and as a head of the seismicity analysis monitoring. Her main research topic in, includes seismic hazard and ground motion, namely site response, high frequency attenuation, and ground motion uncertainty. Since 2012, she has served as a panel expert or consultant on seismic ground motion for probabilistic seismic hazard assessment projects in the energy sector in the US, UK, and Switzerland. She's an elected member of the Executive Committee of uh, European Facilities for Earthquake Hazard and Risk, and an inviting member of the User Advisory Groups for the EU Consortium of Orpheus, which is Observatories and Research Facilities for European Seismology. She enjoys teaching and holds a postgraduate certificate in higher education. She's fluent in Greek, English, Spanish, and French. And I would like to welcome Olga and uh, have her start her presentation on. Uh, part of the rock, reconsidering rock site seismic response and different ground motion. Thank Thanks, Alex. And thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure. Um, uh, so uh, I thought I would uh, talk to you all about um, uh, seismic rock uh, site response and uh, attenuation and how uh, those rock sites are seeming to behave uh, less and less as we expect them to. Uh, so with uh, thanks to Alex again, I'll start by explaining uh, part of the reason why I'm so excited to be in the JJ uh, Pickle Research Campus, because this is my beloved cat, Mr. Pickle. So this is the only time I'll ever give a talk where he's gonna be so, so in the mood. So uh, um, what I'll be talking about is kind of driven by uh, one of Norm Abrahamson's uh, well, well-known quotes, which is that as engineers, we need to design for ground motions caused by earthquakes. So it's not enough to understand uh, earthquake processes themselves. So all of this work is just trying to go towards uh, understanding uh, how particular sites uh, behave, uh, because that's what's going to affect uh, our structures and infrastructures where we uh, live, move, and work. Uh, so uh, as you all know, ground motion at any uh, part at the Earth's surface uh, is going to depend on the source path in site. And uh, <clears throat> the site part is uh, what is uh, closest to to my heart and perhaps to Alex's as well. So uh, I'll start with uh, considering some aspects of uh, amplification. And again, this is going to be um, focused on, uh, on rock sites. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, so there are ver various physical parameters that will affect uh, ground motion. And uh, as you can see in Framer, uh, the famous uh, Kramer um, little plot, so you have, uh, I should point here. So you have impedance contrast, you have discontinuities, you can have topography, uh, lateral uh, variability, basins, you can have nonlinearity. So all of this is going to affect um, uh, amplification. So this is just an example of actual recordings across a basin, inside it, at the edges and, out, edges and outside. So just to make the visual point uh, that amplification affects, uh, and we usually think of them as pertinent to only soil sites, which is my point here, but we're gonna move past that. So they do affect uh, um, uh, 
ground motion in terms of uh, amplitude, frequency content, so <coughs> and uh, how long the duration is. So to exemplify a couple of the tools, um, I'm using this example of a borehole array uh, in Greece, and you can see an example uh, ground motion of a little earthquake recorded there, how it goes up and amplifies. Uh, so the amplitude increases, but also the duration increases going from rock up to the soil, so the Fourier spectra, so in the frequency domain, uh, you can see something similar. And when we start thinking of amplification, it's, uh, so this is just a, a quick crash course in amplification, which most of you already know. Uh, so basically, um, the transfer function of what we have actually here on the ground surface with respect to what is down here, which we would have thought is uh, more or less uh, unperturbed by, by site response. So this we could compute if we had, of course, a, a detailed uh, model. We could do 2 the numerical analyses, as it was the case in the example here. If we have actual recordings, we would be happy to be able to do the standard spectral ratio after Borchardt, so uh, Fourier spectra at the top divided with the, uh, with the bottom, which bring up the actual amplification. So whether is that, that is affected by 2D or 3D effects, they're going to be in there because this is what was going on in nature. This is what was recorded. Uh, the poor man's alternative, if we don't have all of these downhole stations, uh, and which we can basically apply anywhere where we have like more than three or four recordings, for example, uh, would be the H over V ratio. So instead of using this um, uh, rock uh, ground motion uh, and the horizontal component as our reference, we would basically be dividing our horizontal components with the vertical, making the big assumption that the vertical is now the unperturbed uh, with respect to its response, which of course is again a giant leap of faith. But it can bring out most of the time a lot of the, a lot of the aspects that a, a proper transfer function can. Uh, and one little tool that uh, we will be seeing in a couple of slides is when we don't know which way our basin or whatever is underneath is oriented, we can just have a look uh, at the horizontal components, just uh, rotating them um, in all possible directions and trying to catch all the possible variability with respect to, to the directionality of ground motion, like we can see, for example, here. So the fun part is that uh, we came up with this little tool to examine basin edges, and there we kind of did know from theory that ground motion differed a lot in, in different horizontal uh, directions. Uh, but the fun thing is that we also see that uh, quite a few times with rock sites, and rock sites are kind of supposed to uh, to behave uh, rather more uh, evenly and homogeneously. So uh, one way to use the H over V uh, is to apply it to rock sites um, when we have no better information, of course, and to try and gauge whether the H over V at our uh, theoretical rock site or our reference site is indeed more or less close to unity and we don't have a lot of let's say perturbations kind of outside this um, yellow zone so is it always so uh, not uh, really uh, when it comes to rock uh, first I'll, uh, I'll start uh, I'll start us thinking about the kinds of frequencies we might be um, looking at, and that's because most of the time folks doing site response will have studied, uh, let's say, this kind of frequency range a lot, so zero to, to 10 hertz is usually where you get a lot of your resonance peaks uh, when it comes to um, soil ground motion, and I've just made a little theoretical example here for um, soil columns uh, as deep as, let's say, 25 to 100 meters. And when you play with that kind of uh, thickness of soil column, these are kind of the, this is the range of peaks you might get. But just to indicate what kinds of frequencies we can have when we're thinking of uh, rock sites, for example, when we might have a, a thin weathered layer at the top of them, and many times we might not be aware of this, and we might just be assuming that these guys are behaving, you know, rather flat. 
So assuming a thin weathered layer of say two to 10 meters can give us peaks from 10 out to, I don't know, 50 or more Hertz. So just to give a, a general idea of the kinds of frequencies where this might get in the way when we start looking at high frequency ground motion, which is the most pertinent to, to characterize rock sites. And one more thing, and uh, this is fun to show here because this came out of uh, one of the uh, great people in, uh, in Austin, Ken Stokey. Uh, this was part of the Pierre Epry uh, UCLA project of characterizing rock sites uh, up in Quebec. So this is showing you um, a few attempts at two different sites, and you can see how uh, one side is showing kind of similar uh, results in different locations, one close to the other, and another one shows you quite a bit of uh, variability. So it's also rather difficult, I am told, because I'm not a geophysicist, uh, to properly characterize uh, VS profiles for, well, the harder the, the, the site is, the harder it gets, I'm told. So we've had a bit of a look at what reality uh, looks like. And uh, when it comes to uh, applying seismic design codes, this is kind of what we have. We have uh, letters A, B, C, D, et cetera. The Euro code basically gives us the letter A for anything that's harder than 800 meters per second in terms of VS. And your code uh, allows for a, a change in category when we go above uh, 1500. Uh, which does exist in some states here and much more rarely uh, back home. Uh, so for <clears throat> any earth scientists, this is just a, a small um, reminder that uh, most of our work is done on the Fourier domain uh, and the Fourier spectra, like spectra ratios and the cap I'm going to show later on. Uh, but really, what really is used as a tool uh, in terms of uh, making this connection between seismology and uh, earthquake engineering and the impact of ground motions on uh, structures and infrastructures is basically the response spectrum. And that's kind of the, the link uh, between seismology and design codes. So when we think of design codes, everything that's prescribed uh, has been driven by observations of response spectra. And I just, I'm just giving you the little uh, definition here. So the idea is that we might have frequencies but they're not uh, the same as the frequencies we know from Fourier. They're basically the oscillation frequencies of the little uh, one single degree of freedom oscillators we imagine to lie across our x-axis. So I'll show you a little example from uh, back home in Greece after a big earthquake uh, we had when I first joined uh, my current lab. Uh, we had a lot of recordings and unfortunately we didn't know uh, anything about the VAS profiles. So this is just a comparison of the peak ground motions um, with uh, predictive models or GMPs, and these are your response spectra. And you, what I want you to just notice is uh, how wide of a range these light blue guys cover. So here you have the same distance from the source, you're supposed to have rock, but you have over a factor of 10 in the ground motion. And you can see it here, it's basically uh, spanning all of the uh, ground motion prediction equations, the sigma, which is its standard deviation. So that got me uh, thinking whether all of the sites which were rock were actually behaving like uh, good boys and girls and like actual rock. So this is an example of, uh, I think it's the nicest example I've found. So uh, the tool I had to do this was just to collect more data recorded at those stations and just do the H over V that I, just introduced. And here you see the H over V, which is nice and flat for both components out to say eight hertz. So this I think is a really nice reference site up to there. And after that, in the higher frequency range, you start having some amplification and the, the, the two components start diverging. So this little color scheme where you rotate, it starts to kind of open up like a, a little fan here. And this we are kind of less uh, used to thinking of as a typical rock response. We would just want this thing to be flat uh, unity everywhere. And that's kind of the implicit assumption every time we, we say, oh, I installed this station on rock. So I kind of, I think I know how it behaves, whether that means I can use it for engineering seismology as a reference station to do inversions, to understand source path, et cetera or whether I might be, my analysts might be picking uh, mm, 
uh, maximum amplitudes in order to, you know, to do uh, ML uh, after locating events. And here on the right is another uh, rock site, again on limestone. And uh, that's not behaving too, too uh, nicely here. So I don't know if it's also an issue of installation, but in terms of the response, again, it's kind of all over the place. <clears throat> so we started calling uh, these the good and the bad and the ugly, because we have so many different um, cases of uh, a or A and B class uh, for the US code uh, sites, which are not behaving very consistently with each other. And these are just some other examples. And the previous ones were strong motion, but these are actually broadband stations. So these are seismo uh, seismographs, which uh, network operators generally believe are, are lying on uh, well-behaved rock. And these are actually rather well-behaved. These are somewhat, um, less uh, well behaved. And these are some examples from outside of uh, Greece, so uh, New Zealand, uh, Central East and North America, Arizona. So we've seen these kinds of uh, effects in the different places. <clears throat> so this was a little bit an amplification, and I thought it was important to go over it, not just in its own right, because we don't often think of rock sites in this light, but also because it's intricately connected to what is the kind of the heart of my talk, which is on attenuation. So I'll get us started a little bit on attenuation too. Uh, so the same way that amplification at uh, uh, a place on the Earth's surface is very much affected by, as we said, the, the, well, the geometry, as it were, and the properties such as uh, VS and to, um, yeah, mostly. So impedance contrasts and lateral discontinuities being the key factors. When it comes to attenuation, uh, we have, um, so what uh, we think of intrinsic uh, material damping, in terms of, uh, for example, um, uh, soil dynamics, but also in terms of uh, geophysics. And uh, we might sometimes like to think that this is a frequency uh, well independent. And we also have uh, scattering on top of the material damping, which is going to depend uh, much more on correlation lengths, on the kind of small scale um, uh, fluctuations that this profile here might have. And uh, this is true both of soil and of rock. And actually, uh, some folks have shown that uh, uh, rock scattering can be very important and the variability coming from it might be uh, sometimes even stronger than um, natural variability between soil sites. So the parameter that um, we very often use in order to quantify um, uh, attenuation and this is mostly high frequencies because, as I said, that's the key range uh, of interest for rock. So what I'll be talking about from now on, just imagine that we're moving past, let's say, five hertz. So it might be five out to 10, 20, 30. Uh, it depends on the how, how hard the, the rock is. It depends on the tectonic regime. If we're looking at stable continental regions and very hard rock, we often find ourselves moving more and more uh, to the right here, so towards uh, higher frequencies. So kappa, which is going to be the, well, the heart of uh, what follows, uh, was basically invented in the 80s by uh, John Anderson and Sue Hoff. So it's basically just the slope of your Fourier spectrum uh, taken on your uh, S-wave window. If you choose to look at it in the log uh, linear scale. So it's just uh, this uh, spectrum dropping real uh, fast. That was the observation. And if you can record that at various distances from the source, because we don't always have the luxury of having a lot of data very near the source, uh, you will usually see a tendency for it to increase with distance. And that's because um, you start seeing the, well, the regional attenuation, which is basically Q kicking in, and I've color coded that in blue here for you, uh, as opposed to the red, which is kappa zero. And I'll be talking about the 
kappa from now on, but I will be meaning kappa zero. So this is basically the attenuation of the site because that's what we care about in order to characterize a site. And to do that, we just need to kind of get rid of the additional attenuation that the waves um, underwent over the tens or hundreds of kilometers that they traveled until they reached our site. So one thing I wanted to um, caution and that we have been uh, thinking of and realizing uh, more and more recently is that uh, kappa is not your typical parameter and that it's not a, a real property. So we can talk about VS and a lot of folks here are really good at measuring that. And that's an actual property. It's the velocity at which that you can give a definition. So Kappa is basically not something we see. It's the misfit between the assumed model and the data. So it's kind of this slope here. We say that according to the uh, Brun source following omega square for the seismologists, um, we go up in log log space for acceleration with a <clears throat> one to two um, slope out to what is called the source corner frequency. And after that, the source spectrum, according to uh, Brun's uh, theory, the 1970 paper is supposed to be flat. So we say that any deviation from that has to be because of attenuation. And as I said before, that's both uh, site and path. So this is a model, and it means that there's a lot of things that can go wrong in creating this model and other things might include also side effects which are not accounted for in this kind of uh, flat line. So that's what we're going to be uh, seeing in a few slides. <coughs> so there's a bunch of ways to compute Kappa and I'll just mention uh, a couple. So traditionally, if we have uh, big earthquakes to, to work with, then we go above the corner frequency. And as I showed, we, this misfit is with respect to the plateau above the corner. If we have little earthquakes, which means that this corner frequency is found very, very much to the right, then we just go underneath it and work below it. Why? Because we might not have the Nyquist, we might not have a good enough signal to noise, etc. So this is another way to, to do it. And there's folks who try to invert across the entire spectrum, neither above or below, but across the corner frequency, and they can get a bunch of different seismological parameters. But the one key uh, observation is that when it comes to the Fourier domain, uh, kappa is related to the decay. So it's the attenuation is just killing the high frequencies. So we see this drop, right? Whereas when it comes to the spectro, uh, the response spectral domain, uh, if this is a, a, um, a smooth response spectrum, then the different kappas are going to relate to the different frequencies where it peaks and not how fast it decays. So a big kappa is lots of attenuation. So in this case, this would be dying more rapidly. But in this case, a bigger kappa would just means that these higher frequencies are dying faster and though so this peak is getting to go to the left and to the left and to the left of the frequency axis uh, and because uh, there's also uh, there are also a few folks uh, from civil engineering so i'm trying to kind of reconcile both words here as i've been doing for uh, many years now uh, one way to think of kappa is damping so relating it to either the q or what we call c or zeta or d min uh, in terms of G gamma D curves and uh, uh, within a, a layer, well, a, a column of soils or rocks, as it were, if we add all of those together, we can get uh, a lower bound of the kappa. And the reason is that this would mostly give us the damping part, as I said before, whereas if we start looking at uh, the finer uh, structure of a VS profile, so more fluctuations allowing for little VS uh, reversals, et cetera, that is starting to kill an energy much more, uh, to kill energy much uh, more due to uh, frequency dependent scattering. So we might start looking at a Fourier that's decaying more and more with the same intrinsic damping, but with a finer and finer uh, structure um, and fluctuations in the VS profile. So there's more uh, done on this by some folks in uh, UT Austin, so I won't go further into that. 
But I will say that uh, in practice, because all of this is only important to engineers uh, because it links with practice and designing buildings and keeping folks safe. Uh, so when we don't have any seismic data, or for that matter, any geotechnical data to at least constrain uh, this part, uh, what do people do in practice? So a lot of, of the time, they kind of have to pull a number out of a hat, and they depend on empirical correlations that have been observed for kappa mostly with uh, VS, as you can see here. And of course, the stiffer the soil, the less the damping, but you can see that you have orders of magnitude of, of scattering. Uh, one thing that uh, we suggested to the community is that these kinds of relations, when we get to harder and harder rock, uh, probably don't uh, stand so well. We've proposed an alternative model that kind of caps, uh, cap off a very hard rock, keeping it to uh, what we think is a regionally bound uh, minimum, depending on uh, Q structure and types of sources in your region. And this can have a big effect. I've color coded a few of the typical, uh, a few typical uh, zones around the world and their correlations. So whether you chose to go from a thousand meters per second, where you do have data, out to say three thousand meters per second, and you were to believe that this goes ever downward or goes downward much more slowly, or just stabilizes as we think it does, this change is going to make a really big difference to what uh, response spectra and what designs you're going to have to work with. So uh, the last bit is going to be about uh, impact on practice and response spectra. But before that, I thought I would quickly walk you through a few of the caveats, as it were, in computing kappa and in interpreting exactly uh, what it means. So uh, one thing, and that's why I spent um, quite a few minutes in the first part of this talk uh, to explain uh, amplification for rock is that if you have uh, stations like these, then you can see that the amplification is actually creating a distortion to the Fourier spectrum of your horizontal ground motion. So here you're actually looking at a downward trend, not so much because of attenuation, which is cat at high frequencies, but because it's the soil or rock layers creating these fluctuations. So we need to be aware of this. Uh, and these are other examples from uh, other regions. So we saw Greece, but we also see Sina. These are upgoing spectra from the NGA East or high frequency bumps up in Canada. So what do we... Uh, what do we do? Do we, um, and here, for example, you might have uh, a consistent kappa across a very wide frequency band because you don't have any significant attenuation. This is like uh, Saguenay up in Canada. And this is another site in Canada thought to be pretty um, uh, hard, but you can see how kappa is going up and down, up and down like a kind of a fishbone there moving into even into negative values as you're riding up an amplification slope rather than going down this ever decreasing uh, Fourier um, decay uh, thing. So uh, what we are uh, starting to caution people more and more about is that the kappa as we measure it from empirical data, uh, I like to call it amp versus damp because it's kind of memorable as, a, as terms. So you start seeing amplification in addition to damping, uh, damping together with scattering, so the whole attenuation thing. And uh, it does make a big difference how you choose to interpret things. So you can choose to correct for the site transfer function and uh, believe that you're getting to just the attenuation, or you can work where you don't have any significant uh, um, uh, evidence of, uh, of strong site amplification. But as we said before, even if you characterize, there's uh, quite a deal of uncertainty in characterizing our hard sites. So it's not an easy thing to, to decouple. And exactly the same way, uh, we have the problem also with cross the lamp, which is basically just a few kilometers underneath these uh, top few meters doing the same thing. 
Uh, so with crustal lamp, of course, we're not talking about the kind of resonance that goes like uh, this, like we have with near surface um, discontinuities, but we do have these uh, broadband, let's say, ramps uh, where we use the quarter wavelength method and we try to quantify the amplification coming through the crust, like from the source depth up to where we uh, have our soil layers. And you can see that whether you choose to uh, compute kappa where you have this ramp, which is this case here, or where you don't, where it's rather flat, then you might have a systematic um, deviation uh, from the actual value. And I'm just uh, leaving a few examples for you here from Canada. All of these are sites which uh, folks had thought uh, measured a, a perfect VS of 2000 meters per second. So they were wonderful reference sites. And you can have a look just at the different soil profiles and the different uh, site-specific crustal amplifications uh, here. So you might be going above or below uh, the typical values at different frequencies, higher ones, uh, lower ones. So it's not a very homogeneous situation. And of course, one big thing, as I hinted at in the beginning, is crustal attenuation, so Q of F meaning that if I can't compute kappas at very, very short distances, then I need to decide what to do with all these data I'm getting at different distances. So am I allowing them to uh, decay differently? Am I supposed to constrain them because it's the same region? Um, are near field data consistent with the far field one? Should I be allowing for a different kind of distribution uh, with a distance like I'm doing here? So all these are things that uh, if uh, the questions arise, we can discuss them in much more detail, but it's just to give you glimpses of different kinds of problems we've uh, found over the past, uh, what it, yeah, it's been more than 10 years now. Um, and for the uh, geophysically uh, inclined folks, if this is your Q of F over a wide range of frequencies in log log or log linear domain, uh, if you choose to correct the Fourier spectrum in order to compute only the decay due to amplification, you need to be very, very sure of your Q model because this is what happens if you undercorrect. This might be true, and this is what might happen if you overcorrect. So as you extrapolate to higher and higher frequencies, the effect of the Q you assume is much, much stronger. And finally, for the seismic source inclined people, when we get to smaller um, events, which is what we often have in most cases to work with, uh, different stress drops and the way uh, the corner frequency scales with them can make a whale of a difference. If we start looking at these kinds of plots that you're aware of already uh, in the linear frequency scale, which is the scale in which we compute kappa. So if you needed to, to decide on which method to use above or below the corner, and you have little events, you can see that you really don't know what to choose because the uncertainty might really blur everything for you. And this is just an example of how it can blur everything an assumption of a smaller, of a higher stress drop might make you think that you're seeing a kink in the spectrum here or there, um, take all of the different spectra and you might have um, quite a different kappa. So you can use the one method for big events, one method for small events, as I said in the beginning, and there's a bit of a twilight zone kind of in, in between, depending on the region, where it's really hard to know what you're doing. And I, I promised I would have uh, two cents for uh, network operators. So there's really very little, or I think absolutely nothing one can do to get better cappers at high frequencies uh, when the network operators have decided to have a very, very small sampling rate, like was as was the case with the US transportable array, where you could basically see only out to 16 hertz. So we basically had seven hertz to work with. Or if you uh, actually have a really nice sampling rate, like uh, KickNet and KNet, but then you decide to unfortunately uh, implement an in-sensor uh, strong anti-alias filter, which kind of kills everything for you. So you're kind of paying for this data here without actually being able to use it. Uh, so finally, a few implications on uh, practice. I'm kind of being aware of the time here, but I think we're OK. Uh, so what kinds of structures care about high frequencies? Because for those who are doing typical civil engineering, uh, 
more than 10 or 15 herds is probably never cropped up. So critical facilities and safety, uh, so safe shutdown uh, related equipment might be very sensitive to frequencies even above uh, 20 or 30 herds. Uh, when it comes to dams, either small concrete dams, which have high eigenfrequencies per se and themselves, or uh, components of critical importance such as uh, gates might have even uh, higher um, frequencies that they're sensitive to. And when it comes to adjusting ground motion from uh, rock to hard rock, the assumptions we make as to the rock attenuation, which is kappa, can be really crucial, especially when it comes to uh, criti uh, critical uh, structure studies with long return periods. So this is an example of a uh, hazard going from 40 milliseconds, which is typical California, to five milliseconds, which used to be, uh, or six, which used to be typical um, Sina, so Central Eastern North America. There's a bunch of literature references uh, just uh, justifying the hard rock uh, kappa value of five or six. Uh, one problem is uh, most of these uh, values come uh, basically from analytical work in literature. There's not a lot of data, as we already so showed, in very uh, hard rocks, as we showed in our example before. And there's a big uncertainty uh, where each researcher thinks that the tendency should, uh, should go to. Uh, so the, this is a problem because when we use uh, analytically derived kappa values, to compute uh, scaling of ground motions from soft to hard rock. So this is uh, ground response spectra. That's why I introduced the response spectrum before, because the work is done on Fourier, but then it's translated into the response spectrum uh, and oscillator frequencies here in the x-axis. So this is your response spectrum on hard rock divided uh, by soft. So depending on what you believe the kappa is, you can predict uh, a crazy high amplification at say 20 or 30 Hertz. And that can be super, super important for critical facilities and structures. So what we saw when we gathered the available data at the time on hard rock, which was really not a lot, was a much, much um, softer or almost no scaling at the high frequencies. And so this is why we are moving towards reconsidering what kappa means, whether it's only damping, whether it's severely impacted by amplification, and whether it is uh, realistic to take really small values, which are going to give us very high um, amplifications, which have uh, yet to be uh, observed on Earth, at least in any data set that uh, we're aware of. And even a few milliseconds, so going like from five or six to eight or nine or 10, can give you um, a rather important change. Uh, so a peak here in the response back for ratios. And as I showed you before, even assuming the capping of kappa to a minimum that cannot be decreased uh, forever, like some of the equations often assumed, can have a big effect on response spectra. So if, for example, this guy here is the, the blue example. So the, the most, um, uh, the most uh, surprising and uh, strong example. And you can see how both the peak is shifting. And of course, we're also eating at high frequencies. So we're moving from here to, for example, down here. So all of this ground motion at short periods may not exist if we accept that we have this uh, capping of the, of the kappa values, which are regionally bound. So going from the traditional correlation models to capping uh, asymptotic values. So this brings the blue lines, which were peaking at really short um, frequency, uh, short periods, uh, much closer, as you can see here, to these uh, data constraint uh, empirical models we have. And to wrap up, I have uh, a few slides on a topic that I knew Alex was uh, keen to hear about, but anybody who was at the SSA can just go make coffee now, because this is just uh, what I spoke uh, to those guys there a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so uh, when it comes to working on high frequencies, there's a lot of difficulties. So the two I mentioned, which we can do nothing about, is if you choose to implement a very uh, low sampling rate or an incense filter that kind of uh, ruins everything. 
But uh, in the general case where you don't have that, your enemy is usually the noise. And uh, we've recently um, made uh, proposed a method uh, that uh, aspires and I think has shown that can go uh, beyond that and make uh, very noisy data um, usable at unprecedented uh, frequencies. So this is just a screenshot of the paper and the lead, lead author is uh, Bill Pekulis from uh, Patras, Greece, with a little help uh, from the, the rest of us. Uh, so this uh, um, idea is featuring uh, noise modeling instead of noise avoidance. So anytime you need to do any kind of spectral analysis, what you might do is you might compute uh, the uh, noise spectrum and the signal spectrum, whatever that is, and you kind of say that I'm only allowed to use it when it's where it's strong enough. And that usually means that the very low and the very high end is going to be chucked into the, the rubbish. Uh, so by actually modeling uh, the noise itself, we arrive at uh, cleaning up the Fourier spectrum and being able to use it at higher frequencies. So I'll be, um, uh, <clears throat> you'll be seeing ML for maximum likelihood as a, as a symbol and some of the solutions in the next two or three slides. So this method improves the bandwidth uh, a lot. And it also gives us a more uh, robust estimate of spectral parameters. So we've introduced this for Kappa, but believe that it can help with any kind of spectral parameter of the side path or source. <coughs> I do talk a lot generally, but I've never gone uninterrupted for so long. So sorry about the coughing. So this is a demonstration on the method on uh, synthetics. So we produce synthetics, which are very, very beautiful and clean. And then we get the kappa off them because we can. And then we slowly drown them in noise. So this little dot here is all you could use to get anything out of, which is like nothing. And with uh, cleaning up the spectrum by modeling the noise, we're able to pick up the kappa from the slope, which would have been completely not just unusable, but invisible uh, in actual data. So moving from very clean to very, let's say, dirty, very noisy data, traditional uh, noise threshold methods, so avoiding noise, are going to give up pretty soon, whereas uh, the ML method stays robust out to SNRs of almost one, so where we practically can see the signal above the noise. And we've seen that this can sometimes explain this kink in Fourier spectra that a lot of people have been seeing for a long time now, where you have a smaller slope uh, when you're closer to the noise floor. Some of the time this can be corrected with our method. Uh, other parts of the time, of course, it might be your Q of F uh, being very strong, so the eta. And we've seen this kind of thing on data as well. So good data and drowning it in noise and seeing the same thing, how uh, model modeling as opposed to model, um, sorry, noise modeling as opposed to noise uh, avoiding methods uh, keep going strong out to um, even less than uh, uh, zero dB. And I'll just close with uh, three little applications on actual test sites, uh, which proved, uh, well, kind of uh, maybe sadly for us, that even in cases where we have uh, very, very nice, sharp, clean data, thanks to the very low noise, we can still see a, a small underestimation in uh, data derived um, kappa with respect to when we use the, the noise uh, modeling method. So here's a site where you can see out to 60 or more hertz very, very clearly. So it's kind of an ideal site, hence the good guy here. Uh, but when we come to clean up the spectra, we can still see a, a few milliseconds worth of shift. And the shift is to the right because we're actually, as we clean up the noise in the spectrum, we're, we're actually predicting a bit of a sharper slope. So this would generally go towards um, somewhat bigger cappers. The fun part is that uh, we can go beyond cases where the noise is beautifully behaved like what we had just before to cases where the noise is really, really um, bad with peaks because of electricity or other things. And the 
<clears throat> the last example is a case where we had very, very few data. So we could calibrate our and prove our method on one or two good bits of data, like here, where you have all the spectral band to work with, and you can go into the noise and double it and see that it actually holds strong, and then go to uh, very small available frequency bands, and thanks to the noise modeling, be able to believe in what you get from them, and uh, pick up things out of the rubbish and use them where you would not have been able to do anything for this project, because this would have been all you had in for this recording in this project. So especially in stable continental regions or project cases where we don't have a lot of data, but we need to pull out a number, uh, this, has, uh, this has been shown to help a lot. Uh, so being wary of the time, I'll just close with uh, the take home notes and you'll have the numbers and the details in the rest of the slides that I jumped in case you want to go through this ordeal ever again. So basically what I tried to make uh, my point was that there is great variability in rock sites, which a lot of the time uh, us engineers don't think about, and maybe it's only geophysicists who are more aware of this and exploration folks. So geological units, such as naming something limestone on the map or code classes like A or B or VS bigger than whatever, don't really suffice to encapsulate all of this variability that we've seen. We need to understand and classify sites according to their actual seismic response. So data derived and avoid generic cases as much as possible. This is the direction we are trying to work on from now on. So more site specific. Stiffness is not good enough to gauge attenuation. We've seen that with a very poor um, correlations. Apparent damping also includes amplification. Uh, so amp versus damp problem. Uh, we've seen the effect on response spectra, how a few milliseconds can shift your peak and uh, eat away at your uh, short period ground motions that you design with. Uh, remind you that kappa is a deviation from a model and everything that we don't account for properly in that model, we're going to end up uh, fighting with at the end when we extract kappa as a deviation from it. And I closed with showing you our new noise modeling method, which uh, can open the door to using data that up to now was unusable in a more robust way and shows that we are likely underestimating kappa when noise avoiding rather than noise modeling. So that's me. And I would love to hear from anybody who's uh, seen this talk by email or here or otherwise. And uh, these are just a few of the people who are really, um, uh, really important in all of this. And uh, and thanks you all. Thank you so much, Alex, for the invite again. And as my favorite comedian says, thank you to people. Thank you all. I think we have time for a couple of questions. If someone from the audience can I not hear Alexandros. Ah, did the battery die? Do you want the other one? Okay, can you hear me now? Much better. Oh, thank you, Dina. Thank you very much. So um, uh, we have time for a few questions. So I'll start with the people that are present in the room. Uh, yes, Vincent, you have a question. You mentioned the low sampling rate of the transportable array. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what was that value? Uh, so sampling rate was 40, Nyquist 20, oh. and usable range 16. Thanks. I, yeah, hopefully Jack Boatwright had given a, a very big fight, uh, but didn't win it. Yeah. So all of the US has been scanned with this wonderful uh, array, and nothing can be used above 16 hertz. Nice. Yeah. Hopefully for Texas, we use a uh, minimum is 100 samples per second, and uh, in some cases, we use also 200. OK, so you're 45. Yeah, 45 we're 45 maybe. or yeah, 80, 80. Most 80 of the same. time is good. Yeah, we're good. 250, yes, we have some 250. That's what yes. we like to see. Yeah. OK, any any other question, guys? Because nowadays, it doesn't cost so, so much, I think. And as models and methods develop, 
like you know one day you you you'll be able to pull out more like we can now compared to previously and you can't if that's not been saved yeah mike do you have any questions from the chat okay i have a couple of questions then i'll, I'll, I'll as we say back it. home everything was clear <laughs> <laughs> so um what i uh, i'm uh, i've seen from your presentation there were a slide i think uh, a good example was the TST case mm -hmm. that you showed very clearly that the high influence due to the layering of the VS profile on Kappa calculation. Ah, those were some of the ones I sneakily uh, jumped through because I didn't have time with the damping and the scattering and adding them in the soil column. Was that it here? Uh, yes, this one. Uh -huh. Yes, which is really impressive because you got a completely different value for Kappa because of mostly the layering, because I don't think the, the average velocity is changing so much. No, yeah, that's the fun bit. So, I mean, the, the model that's usually used uh, is like this. The is the blue one with the I seven mean, layers. Geotech people will just, I mean, if you run like a numerical analysis on a 2D or 3D profile, you just want to have like some, you know, few thick units. So you might kind of draw this. And I looked into some previous work, like, you know, which was closer to like the borehole logs. And, you know, it allowed for some thin layers here and there. Yeah with a few but, reversals oh, and i'm sure the original log might have been more detailed so this is going to be killing like high frequency energy more and more whereas the if like site response people like analyses up to now would have stopped their plots at, here at 10 hertz. so you would have looked at these three okay <laughs> you're good and the the rest is like well and this was just like a but uh, what, really an what, example it's not even the truth yeah but what is the what is the cause for this is it because when you calculate your transfer fraction, your highest velocity, cell wave velocity, there is not so high. I think, it, well, it is 2.8 kilometers, something like that. This is, I mean, this transfer function is just coming from uh, top divided by bottom after doing, yes. uh, so this is just uh, 1D forward computations. Mm -hmm. And it's because there's uh, more scattering, more waves going downwards, less stuff surviving going upwards in higher frequencies. So that's going to map into... Okay. On the cap. And and the second question is that because uh, you can see it here, like with uh, I think it was deep soil, we were using like more layers, and all of the different uh, points were coming closer to the diagonal, even though they never really reached it, but they were kind of going that way. Whereas in the downhole, they were kind of sitting on it, because you know deep down at two hundred meters, there wasn't so much scattering. Yeah. No, that's true. So. Uh, my second question is um, uh, in one of your last slides that you show when you apply the uh, the noise calculation approach that you developed um, that there is an effect of four millisecond mm -hmm. due to noise modeling. Yeah, this was one of the so this example yes, this is one, like the yes. sharpest. Yes. Yeah. But, uh, my so, question is, what is the difference in the final ground motion of these four milliseconds? What is the effect? Because uh, now, now we, what you are doing here, you are yeah, just that's, like that's that's the key question. That's the key, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's the tricky part because if there is a high influence on the ground motion that you calculate at the end, then whatever we do with the noise, we have to be very careful. That's that's the key thing. Careful meaning aware of what we had been getting until now and yeah, how exactly. do we make it how do we render it consistent mm -hmm. with the so new it, approach so it's more accurate at the end because they, they you're i mean uh, usually i mean um, you know you you calculate your ground motion at the end you provide some uncertainty but certainly no one has done any bootstrapping analysis about how those values might affect actually your final um, ground motion true i mean to be fair this so this sigma could have been this big if you took into account like uh, Q uncertainties, if you didn't have near in data. So everything, you know, I mean, I, I'm making this look big because I'm looking at close in data and a wonderful data set where I had everything, et cetera. Uh, and uh, I did this exactly for a project where everything was recorded at 100 kilometers or more. And the different Q models would just bring, you know, you would have this histogram shifted here, shifted there. Okay. But, uh, but the, the question is valid. If we start uh, 
advocating the noise modeling method? What do we do with all past values which are kind of anchored on something Yeah, else? but uh, other than that, I mean, what is the effect of this difference in the final ground motion model that you are trying to calculate for a site that you want to use for a infrastructure? I mean, you, you have to use a ground motion model yeah, when yeah. you're about to build something. I don't have the calculation for this exactly, but... Uh... So some of these yeah. are for, so this delta kappa is one millisecond and this is more. I, I can only answer when I, if I look into my, yeah. into so my monograph, that... but this might be the effect of, I don't know, perhaps it could be six milliseconds. I'll need to check, but okay. it's going to start looking like that. And it's going to depend a lot also on the VS. So this is coupled with uh, a so, VS and a crustal profile. Yeah, that's mean, extremely easy to pinpoint. So you are like, uh, if, it, if that's your point, as you said here, six milliseconds, that is you are at 20% at of G and this is 30% of G. So this difference might be like 5% of G, correct? In that case, yeah. This, that this case, was just, yeah, uh, just example, a stochastic simulation yeah. that didn't mean anything. It was like, this is an M6 at 20 kilometers. So we're, you know, we're kind of exaggerating the high frequencies because yeah, yeah. we haven't allowed them to, to die away. But it's making the point that even for a, a big earthquake, which normally, like in design, the big earthquakes are accounted for how? By just uh, pushing the plateau into the long periods. But this is showing that if you're looking at like short distances, it can also have an effect like, you know, to the left, because like the... I didn't want to be provocative and show the, the design spectrum, but I mean, it's kind of like that, right? And a lot of what we're seeing is kind of to the left of where the plateau starts. And sometimes like the, the big magnitudes, like in terms of a stress drop, et cetera, are considered like here, but in terms of attenuation of path and site, uh, the, the key range of like periods would be there. Okay. Okay, that, that's, that seems that there is a, considerable and effect. I should have done it here. So I was talking about here and the, okay. the design spectrum might kind of look like this. So we're kind of talking about stuff happening to the left of TB, if this is TB and TC of the plateau. Okay, uh, any, Mark, any questions came up? No. Okay, thank you then. Thank you, Olga, for uh, being here and presenting. That's really great. I think it's a uh, nice, uh, idea to uh, have people understand about the ground motion models and the effect of the different parameters we calculate when we we need to create uh, all the information necessary for the building infrastructure. Okay, thank you guys. It helped. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. <laughs>